series called Red Letters. Amen. A Red Letter series. And what the Red Letter series is, it's the sayings of Jesus. Amen. Whenever you flip through the Gospels and you see all the writing in red, that's Jesus speaking. And so we, we kicked off the series with Red Letter Living. Amen. Pastor Aldo brought a powerful word, a foundation, a lay a foundation. And then last week, Pastor David, he brought he brought red letter sewing. Come on, somebody. Red letter sewing. How many, how many went home and did a soil check? Well, red letter sewing. And so tonight, um, I want to talk to you about red letter growing. Red letter growing. John chapter 15, verse 1. The Bible says, I am the true vine. This is Jesus speaking. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. He says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. It says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So you will be my disciples. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. Lord, and just once again, God, I just come asking you, God, that you would use my life, God, as a vessel, God. Father, anoint me with the Holy Spirit, God. Help me to, to speak the words, God, that you place in my heart, God, for your people, God, for this great church, God. Lord, tonight I pray, God, that you would, you would just move me aside, God, and limit any distractions, God. Let your word come forth, God, with clarity and simplicity, Father. Lord, I'm careful to give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated tonight. Hopefully I don't get too hot up here. Amen. Yeah. So here we see Jesus is giving us an example of how to live a life in Christ that is fruitful and productive. You see, I believe that many of us have a desire to grow in God and become everything that God has created us to be. And the reason why I believe that is because you're here tonight. You're here tonight. The reason why I believe that, that you believe God has created you to be great and God has created you to do great things is because you come to church. Come on, somebody. You come to church. People that, that don't come to church don't really understand the, the magnitude of the call of God or the plan of God upon their lives. You see, and God tells them that in order to be fruitful, they must abide in the source of their fruitfulness. They must abide in the source of their fruitfulness. You see, every tree and every plant and anything in life that bears fruit must remain connected to the vine in order for it to grow. In order for it to grow, in order for it to blossom, in order for it to flourish, in order for it to bear the fruit that it was created to bear, it must remain connected to the vine or to the source. You see, at surface level, this may seem easy, but the scripture here shows us there's two sides to the story. How many know it's always two sides to the story? You see, before Jesus even begins to address the fruit-bearing branch, he takes the time to address the dead issues first. Come on, somebody. Before he even gets into the good part, before he even gets into the fruit-bearing branch, the Bible says that he addresses the dead issues first. He wants to address the dead issues. You see, Jesus said that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. He takes it away. Jesus dealt with the dead issues first because he recognized that you cannot grow if there are dead or rotten things within your life. You cannot grow if something dead, if there's something dead within your life. 
And so he takes time to address those issues. You see, too many, too many people today are trying to build a spiritual life in a dead environment. You're trying to build a spiritual life in a dead environment. And let me tell you that God will not allow you to grow without removing the dead issues within your life. God is not going to allow you to grow without removing those things in your life that will stunt your growth or that will hinder your process. You see, the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, says that it's the little foxes. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little thing. Sometimes we say, oh, man, I can get by. But no, no, that little thing is going to spoil the vine. That little thing, if you, if, you don't, if, you don't get, if you don't get control of that little thing, it's going to spoil the vine. It's going to spoil that vine. So the Bible says that God, he has to remove some dead issues out of your life. And so we, before we end this, you, this new year, we need to ask ourselves, what dead things do we need to remove from our lives? As we close this year and we get ready to move into a brand new year, how many are ready for the new year? How many are believing God for great things in this new year? Well, you have to ask the question is, what dead things do I need to get out of my life? You see, there's two types of branches. Number one, you have the fruitless branch. You have the fruitless branch. And number two, you have the fruitful branch. And, and the interesting thing to note here is that there's two branches but the same vine. There's two branches, but it's the same vine. See, the fruitless branch is the branch that does not bear fruit. It is the ones who don't pray. It is the ones who don't read. It is the ones who do not fellowship. These are the branches that have the mentality, I can do it on my own. You see, Jesus said there are two types of trees that bear fruit. He said there was a good tree and there was a bad tree. He says a good tree is only going to bear good fruit, and a bad tree is only going to bear bad fruit. He says if you're a good tree, you're not going to bear bad fruit, but if you're a bad tree, you're not going to bear good fruit. You see, so the, so, so, so the thing is, is that we have to look at this scripture and say, what branch am I? What branch am I? Because remember, it's two branches in the same vine. It's two branches with the same vine. And so the scripture says that there is two types of trees. And so if you want to bear good fruit, then the key for us is that we must abide in Christ. We must live in Christ. To abide means to live, into, and live in relationship or to remain faithful. Come on, somebody. You guys don't like that word, huh? It's okay. I know you guys are going to be quiet tonight. But the reason why is because when you grow, you got to take an evaluation of yourselves. You have to take into consideration and say, man, what branch am I? What, what, what dead things are in my life? What, what things are hindering or maybe stunting my process? You see, abiding means to remain, to remain faithful or to live into a relationship. You see, and sometimes that's why many marriages can struggle is because they no longer abide in a relationship. You see, instead of living in a relationship with one another, they live as roommates. Come on, somebody. Y'all ain't going to talk to me tonight. Is that okay? Pastor Dave, can I give him a little marriage? Instead of living in a relationship, they live as roommates. And the reason why is because they're no longer being in an abiding relationship. And so guess what? That marriage doesn't bear fruit. That marriage begins to struggle. That marriage begins to suffer. Why? Because they are not being faithful to the relationship. You see, when you're not faithful, when you don't remain faithful to your relationship with God, the bottom line is you're not serving the Lord. You're not serving the Lord. If you're not remaining faithful to your relationship with God, chances are you're not truly serving the Lord. The reason why is because to serve God means to abide in his presence. To serve God means to bear fruit for his honor and his glory. To serve God means to be in a real relationship with him. You see, you can't be in a relationship with God and not be fully committed to him. Why? Because the Bible says that God is a jealous God. It says that God is a jealous God. How, come on, so don't raise your hands. We used to be some jealous boyfriends. Don't talk to my girl, bro. Don't say hi to my girl, right? The Bible says that God is a jealous God. And so when we're in a relationship with God, how many know that we have to be fully committed to that relationship with God? We have to be fully sold out. We have to be fully involved. There's no halfway serving God. 
you have to be fully involved in a relationship with God. You see, I came to tell you tonight that you can't bring dead things into this relationship. You cannot bring dead things into your relationship with God because dead things will always kill what's living. Dead things will always kill what's living. You can't bring a dead, a dead thing into your relationship with God. Why? It's because they cannot exist together. They cannot exist together. See, Jesus said that we are clean because of the word he spoke to us. We're clean, we're washed, we've been purified because of the word that God spoke to us. But see, those who refuse to listen to the word are saying that the word doesn't mean anything. When, 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 when we come for advice, when we come for counsel and we're giving scripture and we say, no, nah, you know what, that's not for me. Basically what you're saying is that word don't mean nothing to me. That word doesn't mean nothing to me because the word of God is what transforms lives. The word of God is what makes us who we are. The word of God is what gives us the strength and keeps us clean. It keeps those dead things out of our lives. You see, the reason why many of us have stained lives is because we're not abiding in the word of God. You see, how many know in order to produce fruit and in order to stay in God's will, the word has to be our priority. The word of God has to be our priority. The word is water to our soul. To our soul. You can say soil as well. The word is like water, right? We're talking, about, we're talking about being a fruitful tree. Fruitful trees don't grow if you don't water them. Fruitful trees don't grow if you don't, if you don't put some water in the ground. Why? Because, because they're going to get all dried up, brittle, and they're going to not produce the fruit that God wants in their lives. If we don't get into the word of God, and if the word of God does not become a priority, our lives are not going to produce the fruit that God has called us to produce. When there is no word, our lives become dry and brittle like old leaves. You see, the branches, they die because they didn't stay connected to the source. They didn't stay connected to the source. We were not designed to be independent. Come on, somebody. <laughs> we weren't designed to be independent. We were designed for relationships. You and I were designed for a relationship. The Bible says this. The Bible says to be fruitful and to multiply. You can't do that if you're not in a relationship. You can't bear fruit if you're not in a relationship with God. God has always intended for us to bear fruit and to glorify him through it. You see, but you cannot bear fruit apart from him. You cannot bear fruit apart from God. Some of us need to get it in our minds that without Jesus, we can do nothing of worth. Without Jesus in our lives, without God as the center of our lives, without God directing our lives, without God giving us the direction we need to go, we can do nothing of worth. I got some advice for you. If you want to try that, good luck. Because, because without Christ, we can't, we can't do nothing that, that is of worth. See, the Bible says that God wants to give us fruit that remains. He wants to give us fruit that remains. You see, I don't know about you, but I want my life to bear fruit that remains. I want my life to be a blessing to other people. When it's all said and done, I want my life to make an impact. I, I don't want to just be, be one of those that serve God and say, hey, man, he was just a good guy. But I want my life to be marked as, man, he left an impact. He left some fruit that lasted. He made an investment in my life. Why? Because I serve God with all my heart. I want to make an impact for God. I want to have fruit that remains. You see, God wants to release more of his power, but only to those who are thirsty for it. He wants to release more of his power. Did you know God's not limited? Come on, somebody. God is not limited. The, 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 the power that we experience, it, guess what? There's more. The power that God wants to pour out, guess what? There's more. But the key is, is that you have to be thirsty for what God wants to do within your life. You got to be thirsty for what God wants to do. You see, God says that he'll remove the fruitless branch, but he'll prune the fruitful branch. Come on, somebody. He's going to remove the fruitless branch, the branch that isn't bearing fruit, the branch that's taking up space. He says, I'm going to remove that branch, but the branch that's bearing fruit, I'm going to prune it. Tell your neighbor, now I got to cut you. 
Now I got to cut you. You see, the vine dresser in the, in, the sto- in, in, in the story we read, the vine dresser is God. The vine dresser is God, and his goal is to remove hindrances to fruit bearing. His goal is to cleanse by cutting away the old, the unnecessary, the dead. Come on, somebody. You, you wonder why God cuts some things off. God says, he, God says you got some unnecessary things within your life. You, you, got, you got some old things that need to get cut off in your life in order for you to keep bearing fruit. So, so God is, is, is the great vine dresser. And so he cleanses by cutting away the old, cutting away the unnecessary, and he uses a pruning sharp knife. Come on, somebody. How many know pruning don't feel good? <laughs> it don't feel good to be pruned, but it's, but it's necessary. See, I'm going to tell you this. As a barber... I've learned that you can't just let anyone cut your hair. <laughs> Come on, right, Cameron? You can't just let anybody cut your hair, man. And so I thank God that, that we, have a, we have God as the vine dresser. I thank God that we have God as the one that is doing the cutting within your life. That it's not man doing the cutting. It's not people doing the cutting. It's not your spouse that's doing the cutting. It's not your children that's doing the cutting. It's God himself because God is the great vine dresser and he knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. He knows just where to cut you. He, he knows what angle, come on, somebody, to get that fade right. God is a master vine dresser. See, the purpose of pruning has many values for us. Write this down. Number one, pruning makes us more fruitful. Pruning makes us more fruitful. It is important to understand that the Lord prunes the fruitful branches, not the fruitless. He prunes the fruitful branches or not the unfruitful branches. You see, this is key because the pruning process comes not to destroy, but to develop. Right? It comes not to destroy, but to develop. I know what you're thinking. You say, man, I'm doing good. I'm bearing fruit. Why I got to get cut? (laughs) It's part of the process. It's part of the process. If, if, if you're getting pruned right now, guess what? You're, you're in the right spot. If you're being pruned right now, you're in the right place. If you're being pruned right now, don't run. Because God is getting you ready to bear more fruit. You see, the unfruitful branches aren't pruned. They're separated from the vine and thrown into the fire. The pruning season comes to the fruitful believer, given the hope of greater fruitfulness in the next season. How many know that God doesn't just do anything for no reason? Right? God doesn't just do anything for no reason. The reason why you're being pruned is because guess what? This new season, you're going to bear more fruit. This new season that's coming around, you're going to bear more fruit. Listen, this new season that's coming around, you're going to begin to see the fruit that the, the, the reason why you felt like you were going through it, the reason why you felt like you were having a hard time, you're going to begin to see the reason why when all that fruit begins to sprout. And you're going to say, now I understand why God had to let me go through this. Now I understand why I couldn't break through in this area. Now I understand what God was doing. It's because he wanted to get more fruit out of my life. Listen, those times you've been spending time praying and believing God and feeling like you're not getting a breakthrough, guess what? There's a reason why you were going through that season. It's because God was getting you ready to bear more fruit. God was just pruning you. He was saying, all right. Keep it up. You're in the process. But guess what? This new season, you're going to see that result of all that pruning. Because God doesn't do anything for no reason. You see, I think we ought to thank God for the pruning process. I think we ought to thank God that he sees the value in us and takes his time to make sure we're in the position to grow. You see, the pruning process shows that God has placed value on us. If God didn't value us, he wouldn't prune us. If God, if God says, you know what, they're fine where they are, let me leave them alone, that wouldn't say that God values us. The, the, the fact that God is involved in your life. Is anybody excited about the fact that God is involved within your life? 
Is anybody excited about the fact and understand that you serve a God that wants to give you more? That you serve a God that wants to break you through? That you serve a God that says, listen, I have, if I have to cut some things out of your life to give you what you've been looking for, I'm going to do it. Is anybody excited tonight to say, God, you know what? Prune me if you got to prune me. Cut me if you got to cut me. Whatever you got to do within my life, I want to get more fruit from this. You see, God wants to prune us for a reason. The second reason that, that pruning is valuable is, is because pruning shows the real source of our fruitfulness. Pruning shows the real source of our fruitfulness. You see, during a season of fruitfulness, it's easy to think we're doing everything on our own. Well, bills are paid. Money in the bank, kids are acting right. Come on, somebody. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. That's a maybe right there. You got me, especially if you got teenagers. Come on now. But in a season of fruitfulness, it's, it, it's easy to have a tendency to think that we're doing it on our own. Right? And just like the branches that become independent, it's easy during a season of fruitfulness to pat yourself on the back a little bit. Pat yourself on the back a little bit and say, man, I'm doing a good job. But somebody once said this. They said, don't break your arm patting yourself on the back. <laughs> See, in other words, in a season of prosperity, we can believe that fruitfulness comes from our labors, strategies, and our talents. See, but the pruning process guards our heart from pride and allows us to refocus ourselves on abiding in the vine. You see, you, see, you see, the pruning process is a process where God has to cut away some of that pride that we get sometimes. The, come on now. The pruning process. You guys are quiet tonight. It's all good, though. That means you're listening. The pruning process is how God begins to cut those things out of our life. God begins to cut away the pride. God becomes, begins to cut away the selfish ambition. God begins to cut away those things that, that, that we can't take in that new season, right? Because God says, I have more for your life. You see, those, those, those are the rotten things that we're talking about. You can't take those attitudes and that behavior into the new season. You see, it reminds us that God, the pruning process reminds us that God did not call us because we're impressive. He didn't, he didn't call us because we're impressive. He didn't call us because we're great. He didn't call us because we got it all together. He didn't call us because of where we live, where we're from. God didn't call us because of none of that. The Bible says that God called us even before we were sinners, even, be, even before we were saved. The Bible says that God didn't look at who we were. He didn't take that into consideration when he called us. If we read the Bible, it says that, look at the call of God. It says not many wise, not many noble not mean none of that. He says, God says, I, I called you when, when, when nobody thought about you. I called you when nobody was, was thinking about you. I called you when you didn't have it all together. I called you when you were all messed up. I called you when you weren't even thinking about me. I called you because I had a plan and I was going to raise you up so that you can bear fruit for my life so that I can get the glory. Listen, God's process is always to get the glory out of our lives and it's nothing to have to do with us has nothing to do with us. Being impressive before God doesn't mean anything. I love how Paul says, Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. That's it. I'm not great because, of, because I'm a Pharisee. I'm not great because I know all the, the whole law front to back. He says, I am what I am because of the grace of God upon my life. You see, our success is not rooted in our performance but it's rooted in God's power that dwells in us and moves through us. Our success is not rooted. Listen, it doesn't matter how good you, how good you can serve. It doesn't matter how good you can preach. It don't matter if you can put a three-point sermon together. It does not matter if the Spirit of God is not moving through your life. Our success is dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Our growth is dependent upon our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so as long as we have the Holy Spirit living in our lives, that's when we become powerful for God. See, the pruning process removes distractions. 
distractions, little foxes, takes away those, 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 those un, unworthy pursuits. The pruning process allows us to focus on what God wants us to do. The pruning process gives us back our vision. The pruning process puts the call of God back before our lives. The pruning process keeps us in line with what God has called us to do. See, thirdly, number three, pruning results in authority in prayer. Pruning results in authority in prayer. You see, the pruning process, it reveals true motives. It reveals true motives. And when motives, when our motives are pure and in line with God's will, our prayers become powerful. When our motives are pure and when our motives are in line with God's will, our prayer becomes powerful. You see, if we cooperate with the pruning process, then you'll receive authority in prayer. Right? John 15, 7 through 8, it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. You see, it's talking about making sure our life is in line with the word of God. Making sure our life is doing what God's word says. Making sure that we're not trying to get a buy on God. Come on, somebody. Well, God, if you bless me, I'm a, I'll live like this. Well, God, if you do this in my life, then I'll change. No, no, no. God says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you can ask whatever you need and it shall be done for you. You see, when we're in line and when our motives are pure, God gives us great authority in prayer. And listen, I want to tell you tonight that we need authority in prayer. We need the breakthrough in prayer because it is through prayer that we are able to see the hand of God move. It's through prayer that the, the hand of God moves. You see, authority in prayer is a powerful result of the pruning process, and it becomes the very foundation from which the new season of fruitfulness begins. It's the very foundation. Prayer is the very foundation upon which our new season begins. But it all takes allowing God to prune our lives, to prune our lives and allow God to do what he has to do within our lives. So I'm going to give you three points tonight. What does it take to grow a God? You guys getting something tonight? Three points, and we'll be done. What does it take to grow a God? Number one, we just talked about it, is prayer. Number one is prayer. You see, prayer places us in a daily position to surrender our lives to God. Prayer places us in a daily position to surrender our lives to God. When we get up in the morning, or whenever we pray, it places us in a position to surrender to God's will. When we get to that place of prayer, it's no longer about us. It's about God's will. It's about doing what God wants us to do. If we look at the scripture, we look at Jesus when he went to the garden. He said, he said man, God, he said, if this cup can pass, then let it pass. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. See, Jesus got to a place where his will was surrendered to God's. Jesus came to a place where he positioned himself to surrender to God daily. And so in order for us to have breakthrough and in order for us to grow, we have to get to a place of prayer daily so that we can surrender our lives to God daily because the more we surrender our lives to God, the more God can do through our lives. Come on, the more God can do through your lives, the more we surrender to God. Number two, the second way we grow with God is through patience. Oh, come on, somebody. Patience. You're like, hurry up and wait. Patience. In Luke chapter 13, the Bible gives us a parable of the barren fig tree. And, and the Luke 13, verse 6, it says, He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it. Come on, somebody. It was supposed to be bearing fruit. 
It says he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, he says, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. He says, cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But the man answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and I fertilize it. You see, the man was ready to chop the tree down. But God says, you know what? Let me get it. Give me another year. Give me another year because it takes patience in order for us to grow. You see, just as seeds remain hidden for a while underground after they've been planted, it takes time for you and I to grow. But it takes, not only does it take patience, it takes work. Come on, somebody. Two words we don't like. Wait and work. You see, it takes, it takes patience, but the man says, he says, listen, he says, I know this tree can bear fruit. He says, I know this tree is a good tree. Let me, let, me, let me dig around it and let me put some fertilizer on it. Listen, sometimes that's what it takes within our lives. Sometimes we got to be willing to put in some extra work. We got to be willing to put in some extra hours. We got to be willing to put in some extra time building our relationship with God, fertilizing our relationship with God, watering the soil and digging the dirt around our lives so that our heart can be good and ready for God to grow. That's why I asked you, did you do a soil check last week? Because it takes patience in order for that fruit to grow. You see, sometimes we need to give up our own plans and submit ourselves to God's plans for our lives. Inviting him to do a deep work in your soul that's designed to transform you. You see, patience, God wants to, God, it takes patience and growing because God wants to transform you. How many changed overnight? I mean, still ain't changed. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We, we still in the process. We've been saved for years and still changing. It takes patience, man. And so imagine if God says, you know what, cut it down, man. They're not growing. It takes patience in the process of God. And so that process is God's plan in order to bring transformation within our lives. Matthew, you can, you can go ahead and come. Lastly, number three. The last way we grow is through permission. It's through permission. You see, we have to pray. We have to be patient. But then also, we have to give God permission. You see, God doesn't force you and I to grow doesn't. God doesn't say, Julian, you grow now. Doesn't do that. God doesn't force you and I to grow. But what God does is that he waits for us to surrender our lives to him. And then once we surrender our lives to God, that gives God permission. That gives him to, the permission to begin to work in our lives. That gives God the permission to say, okay, you surrendered. You've given your life to me. Now I can get in there. Now I can begin to, to work in your life. Now I can begin to mold you and shape you and, and build you into the man or woman of God that I created you to be from the beginning. You see, before, we didn't allow people in our lives. Before, we didn't allow people in our lives. And sometimes... When we get saved and we come to the house of God, we still have that wall up. And, and, and God is trying to use people to work in your lives. God is trying to use people to encourage you. God is trying to use people to build you up. But because we're not used to that, we say, no, I'm not giving you permission to speak into my life. And see what that does is that just slows down your process. That just slows down your process because we need people to speak into our lives. We need people to tell us the things that we don't see ourselves. Come on now, how many know you don't see everything? You don't see everything, 
right? We don't walk around with a mirror all day in front of us. I hope not. You see, but God uses people to say, hey, listen, you need to grow here. You need to grow there. This is what I see within your life. If you make this adjustment, you're going you're gonna to grow leaps and bounds. But the key is we have to give them permission. Because without giving them permission, you and I are not going to grow. You and I are not going to grow. And then eventually, what happens to the things that don't grow? They die. Things that don't grow die. And so I've determined in my heart to say, listen, man, if whatever you got to tell me, then tell me. <laughs> if I got to change something, then let me know. And if, I, if, I, if I'm doing something that I can't see myself doing, please tell me. Because I don't want to be the one that gets stuck. I don't want to be the one that doesn't grow. I don't want to be the one that gets left behind while everybody's moving forward. Because I want to be that Christian. I want to be that man of God that's bearing fruit that remains. Every head bowed and every eye closed tonight. And I think tonight was a night of really evaluating where we are. This is the whole purpose of this series. Getting into the red letters and, and understanding what Jesus is saying. And as we close this year, it's a time to evaluate and say, God, what, what, what dead issues do I need to remove from my life? What little foxes do I need to get away from? Because I don't want to spoil the vine. I know you want me to bear fruit, God. And I know you want my family to bear fruit. I know you want my life to be an example. And so, God, show me what it is that I need to change. Show me what it is that I need to move away from. Because I want to bear fruit that glorifies your name. So tonight, right there in your seats, we're going to make altar call in a minute. But the, um, the worship team, they're going to minister. I just want you to take this time and just really begin to evaluate. Let God speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you.
stand tonight. If you're ready, if you've been there, you made that evaluation, then I want you, I want you to make this altar call. I want you to come tonight, and I want, I want you to say, you know what, God, I'm ready. I'm ready, God, to do whatever I need to do. I'm ready to grow. I'm ready for this new season. So as they begin to minister, once again, I want you to make your way tonight. Come to the altars. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 